For the eight cases currently in the Northwest Territories that occurred in one week, this is the time to focus on containment. Tonight, COVID-19 cases surge in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. We also need to keep in mind that we have a major land claims case coming before the courts in 2022. The elected chief of Six Nations is trying to unify sides ahead of land claim fight. I hope that uh, my song brings a message to all the youth and that they look up to us. And what started as a high school project is now garnering online buzz and radio play. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Nunavut's COVID outbreak now has 47 active cases, 42 of them in Iqaluit. Today, government officials announced which strain of the COVID-19 virus is in the territory, and it wasn't good news. The variant is the B117 strain, often called the UK variant. Nunavut has tested 21 of the positive samples. All came back as that version. Some studies have shown it is 35% more deadly than regular COVID-19 and that the strain is easier to spread as well. Nunavut officials are trying to determine how the virus arrived in the territory in the first place. Right now we're looking at a number of possible routes. Uh, over the, as of the weekend, there's three or four ways that are possible routes that it came into the territory. Uh, we've not been able to figure out exactly which one it is or if there was more than one. Um, but we do know that it was de uh, COVID was definitely circulating in the city of Iqaluit before April 10th. Meanwhile, Ontario has asked the military to provide support as hospitals there are overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients. Multiple sources say the armed forces are preparing to deploy medical staff <clears throat> and teams will be substantive, possibly going to help frontline staff at Toronto hospitals. Ontario's health minister reports there are more than 2,200 patients in the hospital with COVID-19, with 877 of them in, in intensive care. 605 people are on a ventilator. Hospitals in the greater Toronto area have been transferring COVID-19 patients elsewhere in the province. We are seeing increasing numbers of people in our intensive care units and as we are building more beds, we have created more spaces. Uh, we have been, uh, we have set back and delayed some of the emergency surgeries and procedures, but we are still in need of some more um, health human resources, although we've extended them considerably from within. Uh, but we have asked uh, Minister Blair for this assistance and we are still uh, waiting to hear from him. Elliot also says Ontario is continuing to reach out to other provinces and territories for personal support requests. Well, still in Ontario, a 13-year-old girl from Brampton has become one of the youngest people in this country to die of COVID-19. Emily Viegas, Viegas uh, tested positive for the virus, along with her sibling and a mother who remains in hospital. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown says the young girl's death is heartbreaking. Words don't um, describe this type of loss and um, so needless, so um, preventable. I understand this was a family that was um, well regarded in Brampton, very involved in uh, ball hockey um, with a love um, for, for life. And um, when you think about a loss like this, you know, it, um, it, it stings. To the middle province, Manitoba has announced new public health measures aimed at controlling rising COVID-19 case numbers and hospitalizations. Starting Wednesday, no visitors will be allowed at private homes, whether indoors or outdoors. No gatherings will be permitted indoors and will be limited to 10 people in outdoor public spaces. Dining on patios will be restric restricted to four people and food courts in malls will close. These public health orders are set the foundation for our action to reduce the amount of contacts we have outside of our household. Um, but public health orders cannot do this alone. Um, we need Manitobans to understand how critical we are right now in a race between vaccinations and uh, the variants of concern. 
Those new public health measures are set to stay in place in Manitoba for four weeks. That's past the May long weekend. Well, exposure advisories have been sent out in Yellowknife as the territory deals with new COVID-19 cases. Our reporter Charlotte and Jacobs has that update. 90 people are isolating and awaiting test results over what officials are calling a cluster of COVID-19 in Yellowknife. The capital currently has six cases of the virus, one case related to international travel, and five cases related to the cluster. Currently, the Stanton Laboratory is on surge mode and as of this morning had processed close to 900 tests in the previous week, approximately 200 per day, with a turnaround time of just over 24 hours. Many of the cluster's contacts are students and teachers from potential exposures from a city high school, restaurant, squash club, and a bonfire near Yellowknife. On Friday, Kunade Welliday MLA Steve Norn identified himself and a family member as two of the cases in Yellowknife. But controversy erupted over the weekend when local media cabin radio exposed Norn had broke 14-day isolation rules. Public Health held a media briefing this morning. Privacy legislation mandates that no details about contact tracing investigations can be shared. We know that residents are concerned about allegations of individuals posing a risk to others by not following the rules and recommendations. While we do understand there is a public interest in the details of any potential investigations, I will be not taking any of those types of questions. In a statement to media this weekend, Premier Carolyn Cochran asked for compassion and kindness, but noted there are consequences when people break the rules. The territory also has two new cases in Fort Smith, bringing the NWT's total active cases to eight. The surge in cases affects the next phase of the Emerging Wisely Recovery Plan. Easing rules around limits on outdoor gatherings was expected by the end of the month. This is why we also postponed the release of the Emerging Wisely Plan to the end of May. With eight cases currently in the Northwest Territories that occurred in one week, this is the time to focus on containment. Officials are waiting to see if any of the active cases are related to the variants. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, EPTN National News, Yellowknife. Still in the north, some money is coming to build housing in the territories. Today, Northern Affairs Minister Dan Bandel revealed just how much. He said he recently met with Indigenous groups in the north over housing and that the pandemic has highlighted the need for shelter in vulnerable Indigenous communities. Uh, budget 21 also pr uh, proposes to provide $25 million to the government of Northwest Territories to address immediate housing priorities and uh, funding will support the construction of 30 new public housing units across the territories. We want to hear what you think about the housing announcement for the North. Here's how you can continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Well, there's been another unusual twist in the 2021 Yukon Territorial election saga. The Liberal candidate who lost a tie with the NDP in the territory's least populated riding has now filed a petition in the Yukon Supreme Court declaring two votes there were invalid. APTN's Sarah Connor explains. Last week, NDP candidate Annie Blake was elected MLA for Votuk Gwich'in, the territory's least populated riding, after a 78-vote tie between herself and Liberal candidate Pauline Frost resulted in the drawing of their names out of a box. Now Frost, who was a cabinet minister, wants the election in Votuk Gwich'in declared invalid and that the electoral office there made vacant. That's because two votes were cast by people living outside of the Votuk Gwich'in riding, which makes their votes invalid. One vote was cast by a man who has been banned from the community for the last 25 years for sexually assaulting a woman there. Court documents state he was listed as an elector and voted by special ballot. The other vote was by the man's daughter who voted by advanced poll. She was found to be living in Alberta until December of 2020. Her vote is stated to be invalid as she would need to be a resident of the Yukon for the last 12 months. 
The petition filed by Frost also states the electoral officer did not respond to a request to investigate the matter. The case is set to be discussed before a judge on April 30th in Whitehorse. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thank you, Sarah. Well, it's time for a break, but coming up, a look ahead at what could be a drought season. We talked to a scientist and traditional land steward. Stay with us. Welcome back. Environment Canada climatologists have been have warned that this could be a year of serious drought for much of Western Canada. A warm winter and lack of snowfall across the Prairie Provinces has given cause for concern. Wildfires have already wreaked havoc, through, including through the Blood Tribe territory in Alberta back in March, months ahead of when we expect dry conditions. Amy Cardinal Christensen is a fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service who specializes in Indigenous wildfire stewardship. I spoke with her on Friday. Amy, thanks for joining us. So, you know, as a scientist, but also having that traditional land management background, you know, what are your thoughts on what we're headed for uh, in Western Canada this spring and summer? Yeah, you know, it wasn't looking like a great summer um, setting up, but we've actually got a lot of participation, um, especially across the prairie provinces in the last little bit. So that's really helped um, at decreasing our fire risk and hopefully making green up come a lot faster. You know, it's uh, droughts have been a reality for millennia, obviously. Of course, climate change has only exacerbated that. Uh, but what can we learn from our ancestors that would be useful now as we're looking at, you know, people are a little bit panicked that potentially things could be drought-like uh, in a lot of the prairies uh, this summer? Yeah, so, I mean, it, our Indigenous um, ancestors and elders, you know, are the initial true sci fire scientists and they have so much knowledge about fire and, um, you know, how we can look at things in the environment around us to help us. Um, so, for example, I learned from um, an elder that I've worked closely with, Philip Campio, about how, you know, we can look at where hornet's nests are positioned by knowing, you know, if we're going to have a, um, a really dry summer or if we're going to have a wet summer and then what, how that might influence the fire risk. So there's all sorts of things like looking at the spruce needles around your, your house. Too. I mean, I find this your area of study fascinating. I would love to follow you around for a couple of weeks and uh, see, you know, you gathering this knowledge from from traditional knowledge keepers. Um, how are wildfire fire wildfire firefighters <laughs> preparing for this season? You know, especially you know remote communities up north. You know, what are, what are they doing to prepare? Yeah, so I think you know we've got lots of crews starting up and people getting out on. Um, getting their training done, getting ready to go firefighting. And, you know, that's a really good thing. And I think also a lot of communities, as you know, are kind of doing some cultural burning around their territories to reduce their fire risk. Um, there's a lot of fuel mitigation or fire smart work projects going on. And then again, it's just being careful about, you know, not starting or, or um, having those bad fires that come close to the communities. You mentioned a survey. Yes, yeah. So um, for all the Indigenous wildland firefighters out there, um, we have a survey right now looking at, um, you know, what your experiences were like on the fire line, why you were a firefighter, why you left, why you keep firefighting. So, you know, if you're interested, um, you can go. We have a Facebook group called Indigenous Wildland Firefighters um, in Canada, and there's a link to the survey there. We'd love to hear from you. I love it. Well, thank you. We're happy to hear from you, Amy. Always interesting to hear your take on things. And I guess we should all be a little bit thankful, even though we had that, uh, that snowfall that none of us were super happy about. It probably served some good. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. It's been 10 months since the occupation of a proposed real estate development near Six Nations, near Caledonia, Ontario. It's been called the 19 or 1492 Land Back Lane Movement. Well, last week, hereditary chiefs called for a moratorium on the development in their territory and said construction can't proceed without the consent of the people. In a press conference today, elected Chief Mark Hill extended his support to Skylar Williams and the Land Back Lane Movement. We also need to keep in mind that we have a major land claims case coming before the courts in 2022, uh, and it would not be responsible to allow continued development in an uncertain legal environment. 
Um, so is that that where that's for me is 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 where we have to continue uh, to again have these hard discussions. Uh, but again, I think that if in terms of the process as well, we need to make sure that the people are a part of that process and what that looks like. Time for another break, but when we come back, adding some First Nations flavor to the NHL. Provide services and resources to some of the lowest income children in Winnipeg and all throughout northern Manitoba. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This photo was sent in by Denise George Matthew. This beauty sunset from the look of it. Uh, could be a sunrise, I guess. Uh, we don't know where this was, though. Denise didn't let us know. You can always uh, send your photos to share at aptn.ca. Well, send, it to, <laughs> send your photos to share at aptn.ca for a chance to be our next photo of the day. Uh, and remember to include as many details as possible, the who's, the what, the when, the where. Uh, let's go now to tomorrow's weather forecast. Off to the east coast, we've got 11 and cloud for Fredericton, 7 and cloud for Charlottetown. Cartwright, 4 and some showers expected, sunshine and 3 degrees for La Grande River. Montreal and Quebec City, both sunny, 14 degrees, gas base, mix of sun and cloud, 7 degrees there. Toronto, 13 and cloud, North Bay, 12, uh, showers expected there. So look out cloudy with a bit of precipitation expected, 13 degrees. The pod makes a sunny cloud and two, uh, minus two and sunny for Thompson. 18 and sunshine for Winnipeg, 19 and sunny for Brandon. 18 and sunshine for Swift Current, 11 and sunny in Saskatoon. Minus one and snow for Meadow Lake, minus six for Uranium City at Stony Rapids and snow there. Mix of sun and cloud, minus six for high levels. More sunshine, minus six for Fort Chip. Sunny in the south, eight degrees for Edmonton, 19 for Medicine Hat. 19 and showers expected for Kamloops, 14 in Campbell River. Deuce Lake snow, minus one. Fort Nelson snow, minus five. Sunny for Old Crow and one degree, zero for Mayo, three for Dawson City. Lots of sun in the NWT as well. Minus nine for Yellowknife, Fort Lear and Trout Lake, both minus four. Minus five for Inuvik. Snow for Colville Lake, minus six. Cambridge Bay, minus 14. And snow, Chesterfield and Whale Cove, both zero. And snow expected there. Joe Haven, Sunshine, minus nine. Callaway, minus two. And sunny. There are usually plenty of pregame festivities at NHL hockey games, but Saturday's game between the Winnipeg Jets and the Toronto Maple Leafs showcased Indigenous culture. Daryl Stranger has more. Saturday's game between the Winnipeg Jets and Toronto Maple Leafs marked the third annual Winnipeg Aboriginal Sport Achievement Centre Night, supporting Indigenous culture. Like last year, special warm-up jerseys were worn by the players and will be auctioned off with all proceeds going back to WASAC initiatives. Kevin Chief is the co-founder of WASAC and described what the organization strives to achieve. I provide services and resources to some of the lowest income children in Winnipeg and all throughout northern Manitoba. So their services are for children and young people that are primarily focused on building leadership development, summer jobs, and the ultimate goal is to graduate high school and to go on to post-secondary education and get a great job. Ray St. Germain is a Métis singer and songwriter from Winnipeg and was also part of the night's activities. The famed singer and songwriter is a Canadian Country Music Hall of Famer and Aboriginal Order of Canada Award recipient. And he was tasked with singing the national anthem before puck drop. Our home and native land, true patriot love, in all of us command, oh Canada. The auction for the Wasack jerseys begins April 29th and runs until May the 9th. Daryl Stranger, ABT National News, Winnipeg. 
Well, I guess we know what will be on everybody's Christmas wish list well, if you're from Manitoba. Well, what started off as a high school student project on a Saskatchewan First Nation turned into a music video, and it's now getting attention online and on the radio. APTN's Priscilla Wolf has that story. In the game, now we're young and going hard. I don't do this for the fame. Yes, where we live in large. The game this is 16 year old B. Rose, a grade 11 student at Makwa Saigan School. Him and his classmates shot and edited a video for their Native Studies class. B. Rose enjoyed the experience. It was, was, it was nice to see uh, actually everyone working together on, on making this, a, uh, to complete this. It was very, very fun. It was a fun experience. Sheridan Long John, their teacher, said it was a student project that evolved into a music video. The project was for them to produce a small, uh, short video using... Um, any type of uh, movie app in that for their Native Studies 20 and it was just supposed to be a, a picture of their home life, either a picture of a dog or an animal or something. The idea to turn it into a rap video came up when Long John noticed his students' YouTube presence. And then saw, I saw Bros's uh, video channel on YouTube and I noticed he rapped and I suggested the kids, well, let's do a rap, video, a rap song and then it turned into a rap video. Long John says he sent a version to Missinippi Radio and they played it. We submitted it to NBC to be played as a school project and we, you know, it got played on NBC and it was just really awesome. He heard being played on the radio live for the school video and uh, the rap song, how we did it, what apps and things like that. So that was really nice to do. Also, uh, we've been going to the classrooms too as well uh, with Rose and a few of the students to do presentations with the kids on how to do, to follow their lead on how they produce the rap song. And rap. B. Rose, the artist and student in the video, hopes that this video reaches other youth and inspires them. I hope that uh, my song brings a message to all the youth and that they look up to us and su suggest the, that they follow us and follow what we do. And I hope I inspired a lot of you. B. Rose hopes to pursue a rap career. And his next step is to audition to perform in Voices of the North, a Prince Albert Indigenous talent show that takes place every February. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Coming up on Wednesdays in Focus, we are looking at police brutality and the guilty verdict of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin in the murder of George Floyd. Well, will this change how BIPOC are treated by law enforcement? Is this the beginning of police accountability? What about the defund the police movement? Where's things at with them? We want to hear what you think. You can email your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca or you can tweet us at aptn in focus. Well, that is a wrap on your APTN National News to kick off the week. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.